are we doing today? Very good. Making room. So this is part two of the message that we began last Sunday. Uh, we're using Isaiah 54, uh, which what I shared last week, which I'll just reiterate just briefly, is that for some time now, in fact, you could actually reach back into 2018, coming into 2019, where we were processing and talking and, and behind the scenes, various things, before it came public. We went through this last year, a year ago, where we started our first series out of it was Mohio Ake, Knowing God. And then we went to about, uh, is it Tuferi Mai? Okay, Tuferi Mai? What? Or No, Noho Watea, Finding Freedom. And then Tuferi Mai, which was uh, what? Discovering Purpose. And then we went to Rerike Atu, which is what? To make a difference, right? To make a difference. And so uh, we reconfigured and we have realigning and we've been doing various things to get uh, realigned around those four great purposes of God that have been in place for thousands of years, that God has not changed, God is on di dial, he's on target, and he's still outworking those four great purposes in the earth and uh, we just have endeavored to try to realign ourselves to those things. And, and so, so that was last year. Uh, about midway through the year, we began in our staff and various things to dialogue around a number of things in the whiteboard. And we were writing down and all sorts of things were being put up on the board. And as we talked and as we, we shared and various things, there came a moment of time where we needed to collate all that and bring up bringing some statement to that that was simple, concise, but captured a whole lot of things of three months of dialogue uh, of staff meetings that we had been talking about. And what we put up there was simply making room, moving forward. Making room, moving forward. So we've been working with that, talking about that, and then uh, practically Lynn and I talking about the, what is that in terms of applying it to us. So we have gone through, and primarily Linda has gone through a variety of changes in terms of job description and brief and everything of that nature. We've then gone through staff and restructured and re various things of that nature uh, on purpose because we're trying to make room to move forward. So I won't go through all the detail that I shared through last week, but it's just to suffice to say that, that when I come here and we start our first series for the year and we put a prophetic tone to this, because in November last year when I went up to uh, Thailand, uh, I went up there on assignment and different things, but in the early morning hours in a, in a hotel room that they provide for me there, the Lord came about 4 o'clock in the morning and I got this notebook out and I began to write. And the place he took me was Isaiah 54. And, of course, he was giving me some material to share with this particular organization that I was speaking to, and then the leaders of Nepal and the 11 nations of the Himalayan region and such like that. So I used some of that, but the primary purpose is he was speaking to me about us as the main application of this particular passage of, of Scripture. So we bring it up here, Isaiah 54, and we're going to pay attention primarily to verse 2. And it goes, enlarge the place of your tent. Just notice this, enlarge the place. Now, we've got this little pup tent type of thing here on, on the, the stage, just as kind of an illustration and everything. But the first phrase isn't firstly dealing with the tent itself. It's talking about the place that the tent is being attached to, it, that's resting on. It's the fenua. It's the place. And he's saying, you need... You need more room. You need more land. You need a bigger sense of enlargement. And so uh, he was talking to the Israelites. This is a prophetic word from Isaiah talking to them and saying, you need, and he was using an illustration that they could relate to. You know, tents and things of that nature were quite prevalent in terms of a very acceptable form of housing and things of this nature. And so enlarge the place of your tent. He was talking about their land space and different things. And 
And he was basically saying to him, because in verse 3, is because you're going to spread abroad to the right and to the left. And there's a whole bunch of people coming. There's a whole bunch of more people that are coming, and you need to be ready for them. So he says, you got to get, hey, you're going to spread to the right and the left, enlarge the place of your tent, and then let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out, which is what I want to talk to you today. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. So notice in that little second phrase here, and let the curtains, that's plural. So it's not let the curtain, but let the curtains. So we're going to try to describe a little bit of how, that is, how does that apply to us. And the habitations, more than one in the sense, the plurality of habitations. All right? Be stretched out. Well, the first implication of being stretched out is he's saying you're not necessarily going to go out and get new material. You're going to take existing material, but you're going to take some inbuilt room that's already in the material and stretch it. In other words, that God's saying you've got more capacity than you're being utilized at this moment of time. You have more room for, for more for, for something that's already there. It's not about having to go get more or you're deficient or you're defective or you're various things. You've actually got a whole lot of things in place. So it's not about trying to invent new things or to come with a whole bunch of new material. He was saying this to the Israelites as we bring it all the way down to our present moment where we're in now. He's saying to us as a church, I'm not calling you to go out and have to invent a whole bunch of new things. Groups is not a a brand new idea. Church services on Sundays is not a new idea, right? And the basic two things around church life in New Zealand is basically some level of gathering where we call a service, usually on a Sunday, and then some sort of way of gathering together in a smaller way for greater connectivity and greater relationship and, you know, opportunities for gifts to be shared, all sorts of things that don't happen in straight rows. So some time ago, we were, we went as a staff, I think it was, is it coming up four years or three years ago? I think it was somewhere we went up to, and uh, a fairly large church that's, that's, uh, what's that? Very large church. Yeah, one of these 30 or 40,000 size church. You know, we would just be a small little appendage on something of that nature, you know, like this. And uh, they, were, they were talking about their dilemma. So they were letting us in on their world of what they wrestle with in trying to reach more people is that they, you have lines, they call lines, and so pews or straight chairs. And he said, you have lines, but he said the, 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 the greatest capacity for growth and reaching more people is not through lines, it's through circles, And he says in a church for it to be balanced and for it to be effective and for it to to represent the heart of God more effectively, it has to have both lines and circles. It's not one or the other. It's a both and. He was very challenging. And great communication and great picture painting in a sense with words of what it was that of, of, of trying to express and find the heart of God for both the already found and the ones who have yet to find him. It's not one or the other. But our comfort level, here's our dilemma, our comfort level is built around the already found. We've developed our own language. It's called Christianese. We developed our own way of talking. And so, you know, the insider knowledge, you know, when someone says, praise the Lord. Well, we know what that means within the house. But outside, they're going, praise the Lord. What's that? You know, other types of things that we just take for granted, certain phraseology and certain things. And like one time he gave an example about a man that was a non-believing person who had yet crossed the line of faith that was sitting in a circle of of a small group where they felt comfortable to ask questions and get some answers to questions, he, he, he asked the host of the thing, he said, what's all, he said, uh, everything I, I, I can kind of follow anything, but he said, I, I can't figure out what all this mooing is about. 
And he says, what do you mean? He says, well, every time we pray, everybody goes, hmm. <laughs> everybody goes, hmm, and ooh, and hmm, moo, ooh, hmm. And you don't think that's weird. But the man was sitting there, had no, had no church background, had no idea what anything, was sitting there calling it mooing. We would call it agreement. We call it amen and participation where two or three are gathered and agree and things like that. And so it's not for the purpose of mocking that, but it was an example of being willing as a church to go into the tension zone and allow for an uncomfortableness to enter into the picture to make room for those who have yet to find their way to what you take for granted and we take for granted all the time. Let them come in to sit in straight lines, you know, but also to have places that are safe and yet robust and loving and loving circles where we're welcoming. And so all we're doing and all that God's saying is that I want to balance out change point. Change point, your strength is your Sunday services and everything, but you need to make more room, not just for your services and various things of that nature, but you need to make room more in the area of groups and reaching for the already found, which is, which is us, but the, you know, the vast majority of us. But by the way, the already found can easily lose their, week, their, their way week to week. With the spirit of the age... Just watch something on television. Just listen to some marketing and advertising pulling in. You need this. Buy this. Do this. Do that. So all these things that are paid millions of dollars by advertisers to go after you and to manipulate you into the, to being like the world, being motivated and saying, you'll be happy if you do this. If you travel here, if you spend the money here, if you do this, these things will make you happy. And friends, that is false. It's not the truth. You were designed by God. You were created by God for, first of all, for him. You were second, in that, that process of being created by God, you were created to worship him and to connect with him and to spend time with him and have not just some surface relationship that's religious in nature, but something that is rooted and deeply rooted in his love. And then out from that anchoring point of security, of relationship in him, minister his love to others. Whether they receive it or not is not your job. It's to love others and to share that love out from him. And so in this habitations, stretch out. You have it. The, the, the word stretching, we as a culture... Somewhere in time, things shifted. I remember Johnny Boom sharing on this one time about going back 40, 50, 60 years ago. What was that top? What was the top priority? If you put one word, it was to work. That the primary thing in life was to work and to find fulfillment through work and through endeavoring to work hard and, and, and make provision and things like that. But somewhere over time, in just a generation's worth of time, it has shifted where work was not at the top of the list, but pleasure. It's been replaced by pleasure. The goal in life is to get to, to, to be happy and to have pleasure and to joy and enjoy and various things. And folks, that is definitely part and parcel of the arsenal of God. God enjoys. God enjoys fellowship. God enjoys uh, the worship and the love and the expression and enjoys feasting. That's why it's the rhythms and patterns of Israel are all built around three major feasts where God shows up and says, I love to come down and party. But it's not the goal. The top goal at the top of the list is not that. In our culture, comfort, okay? Comfort has become a huge priority. 
uh, we at the church here have worked hard to tweak everything we can in the building because if we building had not, friends, it would be too uncomfortable, particularly on a muggy, hot day. We endured it for years. Freezing cold winters would felt just as if the temperature inside was the same as outside. And trying to heat this place was horrible. So we've been on a pathway of trying to make things come. The chairs you're sitting in, some people love them, and there's others that don't think. I find them 10 times, one, how many times more comfortable for my frame and the way I'm built than the previous models. And someone who's got a back trouble and problem is saying, amen. And there's others that are going, I don't like them at all. But our evaluator is this word comfort. When we first came to the country 41 years ago, Linda and I could not believe because we had been, this American idea of comfort had been part and parcel of our world for some time, but it wasn't so prevalent here. For example, your cars that you used to drive and, you know, whether it was the Holden or the Ford or, 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 or the Hummer, Humber, Humber. I went, I drove down the road and we were going behind a Humber. And I went, what is that? <laughs> we drive before the uh, Kaimais had been straightened out a little bit and the roadway was made. The, the switchback effect over on the other side of the Kaimais was that we were driving that in a Morris 1100. <laughs> now, you young people are looking at me like, He's talking in tongues there, <laughs> right? But just trust me, it was a British-made car that um, it needed help. <laughs> but no creature comfort, crank down windows, no AC, right? Bench seats, uh, a lap belt, maybe just for the front seat alone, uh, very little plastic, no idea or no thought of any safety features like an airbag or, or any of these other things, no five-star rating, no this, no this, no this. Whereas now you go to buy something. You that have been around, like, you remember those days. Some of you younger, but you didn't have to suffer through some of that. But some of you remember those days, and we might even romanticize those days. But how many are grateful that technology has advanced you know, that seat construction called ergonomics and all sorts of things in it because we've taken comfort to be one of the top priorities by which we evaluate everything. Is it comfortable? If it's not comfortable. If I'm not comfortable in the church setting, I'm not coming. If I'm not comfortable, I'm not sitting there. If I'm not comfortable, I'm not going to subject myself to that. That's Christians, let alone the world. So let me read the fine print to you. In my experience of walking with Christ for 53 years, here's what I have found. The greatest growth of my life is when God purposely, with intention, great love, stretches me and puts me into my uncomfort zone where I'm uncomfortable, where it's hard, and I'm being confronted with things that I don't like that he is causing me to have to either face myself, face my limitations, face my own attitudes, face a lot of stuff, and stretch to move what something that is not within the radar of my comfort zone to make it where it becomes part of my inner world expressed outwardly. Does that make sense? That's God's way. That's what God does. He's not being mean about it. He's being kind about it. So comfort is something that we have to, in this church, be willing for God to make us and take us and let leadership lovingly, kindly, patiently, but yet persistently move us intentionally to more and more uncomfortable arenas so that we can make more room and stretch out the curtains of the habitations of ministries that are already in place to reach more and more and more people. Sitting on Poikie Road here for 
30-something years, 32 years now. 1988 was when they first had services in this building. It was just a shell of a building. It wasn't even lined. And they moved into it in the middle of the year, like July. And some of our old pioneers are the ones that pioneered this place, like June Comps, you might remember. I take that name. And she used to talk about bringing her best woolen blanket to come to church to sit in this very building because they shivered through the service in the song service and in the preaching, but they were pioneering something. They were making a way for you. They were making a way for you, and they, were, they had a sense that they were. They, they were. they were, by faith, shivering in the middle of July when it was freezing cold, and there was no heating at all and no lining on anything and no insulation at all in any way, shape, or form, and it was as if the same temperature outside was the same temperature, and they could see their breath, and they talked, and they laughed about it to tell me and Linda about their stories of pioneering that when we weren't around at that time. But talking to them, asking them, why did you stay? Why did you endure? And this is because we were making a way for others to come, others to join. God was indicating back then, I got minutes where I was reading about it, and he was, he was actually taking great pains prophetically to talk to the leaders back in the 80s. In 1986, before they even broke ground fully on this piece of land, God gave a prophetic word to a man that was very detailed. They did not accept that as, as a word from God. And years later, God brought it back and had us Leaders repent before God for a lack of unbelief from the leadership of the house before I even came. But we had to own it before the Lord as something that was offensive to him because it was an act of unbelief. And it had to do with the building that we're in presently. It was a very detailed prophetic word. It had various scriptures, various places. And here's what the gist of it, the long and short of it, was God was indicating back in 1986 that the building that they were to build would be over double the size we are now. Didn't happen. That's okay. There's no condemnation. It's, you know, we've, we've taken this and we've worked with it in various other ways, shape, or form, but God was indicating this was what he was saying through it. This church, I've destined this church to be a large, influential church, and I want you to make room. So he was saying you make room in 1986. And various other times on the journey where we've been and he's brought this before. And what he's doing is not new. It's not new. It's not a new word. It's an old word that is being brought again to another juncture of time where it is an appropriate word for us to wrestle with. So we as leaders are wrestling with that. So all we're doing, and I'm just the... I'm just the messenger boy, is to come along and now incorporate you to get enter into the season of wrestling. So the question is, for you individually, for you individually, how are you going to make room? What is it God going to lead you to make room? What does it look like for you? to take this word, if it's a word from God. How do you do that? Well, we can paint some scenarios and we can put some things. Some of it would be that some of you that presently say, I have no time for groups, stretch yourself into the uncomfortable zone to get a part of something that God is ordering for this house, for the strengthening of group life in to grow the number of circles not just the straight lines, but the circles, to include more people. That could be an application for somebody here, maybe many people here. What is it that you're going to do that God may stretch you in relationship to people who are of a different ethnicity than you? What would perhaps it look like for you to stretch yourselves into a communication with someone of a different generation? What would it look like for you to stretch yourself to go intentionally and build a connection with someone who is not within the circle of follower of Christ? 
These are the things that are on my heart, on our hearts, that we're wrestling with, and we're wrestling with not to to throw at you like in a condemning way, how come? It's more like, will you be willing to go on a journey with us? This is our journey. This is the leadership journey. This is the intentionality of things that we're wrestling with to not let go of certain things, but on the other thing, allow some things to change. Service times will probably change here in the next couple months, and we'll be announcing that. We haven't settled on the fullness of that, but it's coming. That's a change that's going to happen. Why? For the purpose of making room. That's the motivating. The motivating of it more than anything is the intentionality is not more people because we want to brag in numbers. <sighs> haven't got time for that. I don't care about that. But we do want, we want to please the heart of God. And the heart of God says there are more people. Now, let's just put practically here. We sit in Ohauiti. A good portion of you don't live in Ohauiti, but some of you do. But this is the church gathering place, is this place right here. And in the midst of this area, friends, we're pretty much it. Among five or 6,000 people that stretch from Hyrene up into the farm area above us here and along primarily on this side of State Highway 29 and bordering into Welcome Bay. This is not including Welcome Bay. It's not reaching into Magatapu or Windermere or Pies Pa that goes this direction. It's just simply if we were to draw kind of an oblong circling element of just this place called Ohauiti, there's at least five to 6,000 people that live here. And, right, and we're it. There's not a school. Let's go into Magatapu. That's the closest. There's a convenience market, which brought Manoj, Brother Manoj. He's not brother, but I call him. I treat him like he's a Christian. He's a good man. He's an Ohauidi dairy. But that's it. There's no petrol station. There's no infrastructure. There's no anything, and there's reasons for that that back up over 50 to 60 years ago when decisions were made, when it's noted in the minutes of a land transit authority and a combined city council on deciding this ring road, which is what they, motor, they called it a motorway, and they designated a motorway, they decided and said that on note that no one would ever live beyond this ring road. Talk to the 30,000 people that live now on the other side of State Highway 29, stretching from Wilkham Bay, banding up through here, through Pies Pot, on into the lakes. So it's minuted that they expected most of the growth, if not all the growth, to go towards the north and to the west, towards Bethlehem, to Pune, and beyond. And so that's why you find infrastructure. That's why you find schools. That's why you find all sorts of things. This was decided 50, 60 years ago, minuted. So there is this whole letting, and yet God keeps coming to this church and saying, this is your jurisdiction. This is where your family home is. This is where I've placed you. I want you to develop a heart for it. I want you to reach into it. I want you to be influenced in it. I want you to be the ones that make a way and start calling for those sort of things that help people and bless people to start coming into this area of Tauranga. So we started doing that. We pray in that way. We're asking God for ways. We, I called Tim B. Powell, how I met him personally. I'd met him several times, but then I asked him to come to the office. And when he came to the office, sat down because he was going around in the lead up to the election of mayor of different places and saying that Matu mattered and Bethlehem mattered and Welcome Bay mattered and Papa Moore mattered. So I wrote to him and said, Tim B., would you come to my office in Ohauiti? And, and, and one question, does Ohauiti matter? His response was less than 10 minutes. Oh, how E.D. matters to me. I'll be there on such and such date at 8.30 in the morning. So he came. We had a great chat and a great catch-up, and we talked to him. I shared with him about this building, about our youth ministries, about different things we've got going on, and about Oh Howidi and about it being the stepchild of Tauranga and that we needed help from government, governance, to start solving some of the issues in roadway and various other things around it. And he said, I hear you. So I'll keep that going. 
Then we prayed for him as a staff. We were assembling the staff. We brought him into the staff meeting. We just gently, kindly prayed for him and the Holy Spirit <laughs> touched him powerfully. He acknowledged it publicly when he won the election. He said, there are two men I want to acknowledge, Stephen Hansen, whom we prayed for earlier, and Pastor David Dishron of the Change Point Church. He said, those two men if had, were key men that helped me, and we weren't favoring him. We were, I was praying with Kelvin. I was praying with others that were, I, I, we were praying for all of them. This, this last election cycle was pretty vicious. So we were praying for all of them. Okay, but when we prayed for him, God met him in a very supernatural way because he's God's man. He's God's appointed. And so I said, Does, oh, how would he matter to you? It matters to me. It matters to us. And I'm saying to you, I believe God wants to build a greater heart for us collectively as a church, irrespective of where we may be in the Toronga Moana because we all beyond this place have a heart for the full Moana. Okay, we do. We have for the full Toranga Moana and all the iwi and all the various ones. But right down the road here at 800 meters down this little road called Waimapu is Waimapu Marai. And I don't know if anyone from that Marai is here this morning. Sometimes they come. We have some that journey with us. But friends, it is the most broken. It is the most impoverished. And it is the one marae out of all the marais that they, they all have battles and they all have various things, but it is the most displaced and the most hurting marae in all of Toronga Moana, in my opinion. And it's just 800 meters down the road. So we've been praying, praying, and praying. And over this last year particularly, we started to see a bit of connections and various things. And I wouldn't want to say to you how some of the entrance is coming about, just recently, the most recent one was because there was a death by suicide that I was called into, and Hui Kakuhu Kawi, our, our chief Komatua, was called in. In fact, this morning, he was going to be involved again with the family, the wider family, and various other things. That's just 800 meters down the road. So God is saying on the radar, I need a church that will not just sit in straight lines, but will also circle and will also learn how to carry the heart that God has for more people and learn how to be stretched out into uncomfortable zone, whether it's Tereo, whether it's journeying on a number of other areas, to take that journey and continue that journey, but letting him grow the heart. So I'm going to call upon Karen because there's one Maori word there's one Māori word, one Māori term that probably captures all the things that I've been trying to say that they say it so wonderfully. And, and it's called manakitanga. Manakitanga. And rather than me try to share that with you, I'm, I'm, I've asked Karen. She shared in the first service, did fantastic. She would come. She would share with us what does that mean from a Māori heart and a Māori standpoint to it, and let that be the finality of this message today as we close off. And I've asked her then to then lead us together in praying with us and for us from Manaki Tanga. Thank you. Uh, kia ora tato te um, Firstly, I want to say that I'm not an expert in Manaki Tanga, and um, we had Hui Kākuhu here in the first service, and I was like, oh. <laughs> He should be talking about this, but I'll just share from what I know, and I know many of you can add to that, and, um, and I also want to say that um, what I'm going to read out, it was actually Wari and Steph sent this to me, so nā mihi to them. So here, are they there? Here? No? Okay. So anyway, um, you know that I've been studying Māori. I'm into the fourth year now. And as a tauira or a student, um, we're taught to, if we want to know the meaning in the heart of a Māori word or a Māori kupu, then we can, you know, one, one uh, strategy is to break the word down. And so if you look at the word manakitanga, um, mana. So mana means everybody has mana. We're created with mana. God gave, created us with mana. And that's basically value and worth. God loves everybody. 
no matter which tribe you come from, no matter which ethnicity, no matter what background, we're created in His image and He loves us and we all have great worth. So that's mana. And then there's aki. Aki is to lift up. So that's how you get mana, aki, to lift up. So you're lifting up the value of the person. You're lifting that up beyond you, aki. And then tanga, tanga's got many meanings, but tanga can be an emphasis added to that word. So it gives it emphasis, it's important. But it's also a group of people. So manaki tanga, even though we can, we can um, do that individually, it works best in a company of people. And that's who we are here. And then I'm going to read up, out some more. Hang on my phones. Yeah, here we go. That's no, okay. Okay, literal meaning, a company of people to support, take care of, give hospitality, to look out for, show respect, generosity, and care of others. Loosely means hospitality, embracing people to welcome and serve. Visitors and others are given prime importance. In this sense, visitors feel a sense of importance, respect, and welcome while in our care. Manakitanga is behaviour that acknowledges the mana of others as having equal or greater importance than one's own. Through the expression of aroha, which is love, hospitality, generosity, and mutual respect. By such behaviour, all are elevated and our status as a whole is enhanced. Building unity through humility and the act of giving while taking care not to trample on the mana or the value of others. That came from the Māori Party, actually. This principle incorporates our responsibility to act at all times in a manner that uplifts and enhances the mana of those around us. It demands the highest standard of behaviour towards one another and acknowledges that it is only by upholding the mana of others that our own mana remains intact. It requires us to provide positive role modelling for our tamariki, that's our children, our whānau, families, and the community. The exercise of manakitanga maintains the integrity of individuals, whānau, hapu, and iwi, and the wider community. Some biblical re Bible re uh, references, mutual respect, Philippians 2.3. Philippians 2.5, Aroha, 1 Peter 4.8, Hospitality, Acts 2.42, Titus 1.8, Generosity, 2 Corinthians 9.6. And so, Lord, Tuku whakawhetai ki a koe, Ki a koe, te matua nui, te rangi, te tama, a ihu, te wairu a tapu. Tō mātou aroha ki a koe, ko koe te kingi nui, ko koe te aroha, ko koe te manakitanga, afina tia mai mātou i tēnei rā, ki te puta mai i tō aroha, i tō manakitanga, i tō tiakitanga, me ngā mea katoa ki tētahi, ki tētahi, ah, ki te whānau katoa i o hauiti. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word today that you have spoken clearly. We know that this has been a journey over time. We wanna thank you firstly for our leaders David and Linda and our leaders coming up, we wanna thank you that they have held your heart and carry your heart and have extended your heart to us so that we in turn can stand with them and outwork your heart to each other, to our families, to our neighbours, to our community, 
to Ohoiti in particular. We thank You that You love Ohoiti, that You have a plan and a purpose for this place. And we thank You that You have chosen us to outwork Your heart. Help us, Lord. Help us to do this, not in our own strength. Your Word says You've given us Your way to us. You've given us Your Spirit. We don't have to strive, but we just need to allow You to work through us, change us. Help us to be uncomfortable. Help us to put ourselves in situations where it's awkward for Your glory, Lord. Help us to be who You've called us to be and help us to show non-believers and believers what your heart is for this place, what your heart is and help us to build, to build your kingdom. We say your kingdom come, your will be done. I tēnei wahi, I tēnei hahi, I tēnei wahi, I tēnei whenua. O ohauti, i tauranga moana, i aotearoa, me ngā whenua katoa. For your glory. Amen. (laughs) Oh, awesome. Awesome. There was um, plenty of tears flowing in the first service. So um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reminded the the, uh, girls, um, my girls, they do dancing and this year they've just started a stretch class. And after their first class, I said to, um, I said to them, how do you feel? And they're like, sore. But why do a stretch class? Because it's only gonna grow their capacity to become better dancers. And so church, let's, em- let's embrace the stretch class in our life. Amen. <laughs> Find a stretch class. It could be called a small group. It could be called a ser- an, an area of ministry to serve in. It could be talking to your neighbour. It, it could be witnessing. Whatever the stretch class is in your life, embrace it. Amen? Amen. Tonight, 7 p.m., we're kicking night service off again. <sighs> Who's looking forward to that? Oh, we're looking forward to that. It's going to be awesome. And um, Amy's going to kick it off, and she's going to smash it, as she usually does. So it's going to be awesome. Uh, other than that, we've got coffee and tea. Stick around. If you need to download the app, you want to know more about groups, come see us at Connect Point. God bless you.